ISO 14001, its aim is to specify requirements that enable an organisation to achieve the intended outcomes it sets for its environmental management system. An environmental management system is part of the management system overall that's used to manage environmental aspects, fulfil compliance obligations and address risks and opportunities. Companies have uh, management systems for all sorts of things, and that might be a quality management system, which sits in, sits in ISO 9001, a safety management system, which is just being upgraded and moved across to 45001. Um, either way, uh, most companies have systems, standard operation procedures, um, and those sorts of things, which enable that company to document and, and then to be able to manage their day-to-day -day activities. What makes up an environmental management system? An environmental management system uh, is composed of four main tasks which contribute to a system that is continuously improving. And that continuous improvement forms the foundation, that, that absolute underlying process um, of which ISO 14001 is based on, the ISO 9000, which is the quality, the ISO 45001. All of these systems, uh, which end up being an integrated management system, which is something that you'll work, work with later on uh, into in your career, but continuous improvement consists of four main areas, and I'll run through these. Um, they are plan, the planning phase, the do, this is your day-to-day -day operations, the support and operational phases, the check, the check phase, this is performance evaluation, and the act, the act. This is an area of improvement where we take the information that we've learnt within that performance evaluation phase and put it, put that information or those, those recommendations into act, um, which gives us that improvement. And then it goes back into our planning phase again. So it's a cycle. And it goes, it goes right through, and it's something that should continue, continuously occur for the life of that project or that operation. During that planning phase, we're looking at the needs and the expectations of other interested parties. It's a, it's a process of establishing objectives and processes so that we can go about achieving um, the desired outcomes of that, of that company. Getting into that doing phase, that's that implementation, and that's where these processes um, and and systems are actually hitting the ground. What's actually going on? This is the day to day activities, uh, that checking process that we mentioned before. It's a monitoring, it's a measuring process, and we we throwing this um, these measurements um, up against our policy, up against our objectives. Are we, are we reaching these things? Are we actually delivering what we said that we were going to do? Are we delivering on the, on the obligations that we have uh, from a legal point of view? Um, and so we're conducting audits. We're doing daily or weekly or monthly monitoring, uh, all of those sorts of things, and feeding that information back in analyzing, most importantly, analyzing that information so that we can get, uh, we can finally make decisions and, and know whether we're going in the right direction or the wrong direction. And that, that fourth process of acting, um, and that's the area of improvement. We're looking at taking, taking all the information that we've learned um, within that evaluation process and then going and making adjustments, um, rewriting different processes and systems or um, setting new processes in place to avoid ending up with undesirable results. Steps in developing an EMS. One, first you need to look at the environmental aspects. What values are within the environment and what risks or impacts does your operation pose? You need to conduct that risk assessment and, and look at how you're going to mitigate or manage those, those risks to a process. And that can be quite an in-depth process. You need to acquire a lot of information and talk with a lot of people to, to get that information. Next, you're going to look at establishing your environmental policy. And that often work, uh, is involving working with upper management to find out, and it needs to be signed off ultimately by the top management. Um, but your environmental policy 
tells everyone, internal and external, where is your company going? And number three, environmental objectives. We're looking at how you're going to get where your environmental policy says you're going to go. So those objectives are, are clear statements which are going to be smart. They're going to be specific and measurable and, and several other items in there. We're going to look at um, the, the fourth process in there is establishing some key performance indicators and or optics. Now, optics, I suppose, is a word for, for charts and graphs. Things like, um, if you think of a speedo on a car, it tells you how fast you're going and, uh, and your key performance indicator might be saying that you're going to go at 100 kilometres an hour. Okay, so there's an indicator, you know, where you want to be operating below or above that, that area. So that's, your, your indicator tells you whether you are performing or whether you're not performing. Um, and if you are performing, you'll be reaching your objective. Um, and if you're, uh, if you're reaching your objectives, then you will be meeting your policy. So you need to go through a process of establishing all of these things. And then, once you've done that, you can then go about planning and developing the procedures and the systems that is going to make up your environmental management system. Those um, procedures and systems can exist in a series of documents. Um, initially, they probably will, and then they'll, they could very well end up sitting across and going on to a, an interactive interface such as uh, an internal website. Um, that um, anyone within the company can access, so uh, access freely, so they can go about making sure they're following those systems, um, and making sure others are as well. Then once once you've um, planned and developed six, you're going to be looking at the implementation of those, and that's a big process of training and working with the uh, the individuals within the company uh, to to then get the systems that you have developed. Um, to get them actually running and working properly. Once you've gone through that process of training and education and, and establishing and implementing those procedures and systems, then you can step back into the monitoring phase and monitor that performance. Are people doing, are they following the system? Are you achieving what you're meant to be achieving? And that's where you look at the KPIs, the key performance indicators uh, that you established earlier on in the piece you start using those at that point. Are you reaching those levels that you initially expected? And then you are going to take that information and you're going to look at them improving. Um, and that underlying thing that you'll find again and again in ISO 14001 uh, is improve, continuous improvement. And that's what is the, the underlying factor of, of, of this system, to be able to continually look at how you're performing and making it better. Right at the onset of developing an environmental management system, uh, there are a lot of things that you need to consider. Some of these things include looking at external and internal issues that, may, that the company may face. Um, as I've mentioned in other areas, uh, an environmental management system does not just focus on what happens inside. It has a very, you know, environmental responsibility these days requires um, you to be looking outside of what's going on within the organization and your suppliers and, um, and be it customers, your upstream and your downstream. Other areas to consider when developing a scope of an, EA, of an EMS are things such as your compliance obligations, what's in your licensing condition, what's within the, the legislation itself. How are you going to meet these things? And what aspects of this um, environmental management system do you need to focus on to ensure that you are achieving compliance? Because remember, compliance with legislation is it's a non-negotiable. You must do it. You have to do it. And you have to plan to do that. And it's the, it's the, complying with legislation is the absolute bottom standard. Yeah, it, you know, a, an effective environmental management system is going to be aiming way higher than simply complying with legislation. I'll go into this a lot more um, down the track. Um, you need to 
we'll be considering the organisational units and the functions uh, within that company. So it's necessary to have a good understanding of how this company operates, what it does and, um, and what it achieves. And, and it's um, where it sits, its physical boundaries, how big or small, what restrictions are placed on that company, how it operates within those boundaries. Um, you also need to be looking at activities and the products and the services. What does that company do? You need to have a very solid understanding of this because you will be integrating uh, integrating procedures and methods and measures within the processes that uh, the company has to develop these products or deliver those services. Um, <clears throat> you also need to be looking at the authority um, and the ability um, of this system to be able to control and influence. And now that is something that resides more with uh, management. Management within that company must be able to accept and and know and fully understand that this this kind of document is one that's going to govern govern how that uh, company operates in the future. Obviously, you've got the the aspects that need to be managed, such as legislation um, and compliance with that. But if you want to achieve your company objectives that are stated um, and in line with your company policy, then this document is right up there with some of the most important documents that sit in that company and, um, and it needs the full support of senior management so that this document is implemented and ab abided by and that it's regularly monitored and, um, and then um, and reviewed. So an important thing to remember in that process of developing this EMS is to plan to establish this system to think about the implementation of it and how it's actually going to be delivered on the ground, um, how it's going to be maintained and monitored and how you're going to watch that performance and then to go about correcting and improving continuously throughout the life of the program or the operation that you might be doing. And this continual improvement process becomes the foundation, the critical foundation of any effective ISO 14001 system, be it or 9000, which is in your quality, or the 45001, which is safety. Environmental aspect and risk assessment. What's an environmental aspect? It's an element of an organization's activities, its products, its services that can interact with the environment. So when we say that, um, it's an element. So environmental aspects um, include all sorts of things from, from raw resources and materials um, through energy types. Well, how much use that we, we're actually consuming? Um, where has it come from? Uh, the, the byproducts that are produced from our processes and you know, do we use those byproducts? Do we on sell them? Are they waste? Um, what sort of emissions we have to the air, to water, to what risks and hazards um, from, uh, we get from chemicals, hazardous materials on site, that sort of a thing. No, no, activities, the activities that we actually undertake, do they cause land contamination you know, with our spills, with um, leaks, poor management on site, um, the lifespan of our products um, and, and what impact that has on the environment. End of life disposal, uh, other uses of products. Um, environmental aspects also include the, the, the output of the noise, the light, the visual offence, odours, similar, uh, yeah, similar sources of nuisance, environmental nuisance. Environmental nuisance is a term used within the environmental legislation. That's something you've got to manage. Packaging, what do you do with it? Where does it come from? And, um, and transport, um, deliveries, staff, vehicles, etc. All of those things make up environmental aspects and, uh, and they present risks to the environment. And, um, and a major part of establishing and managing an environmental management system is managing that risk, the risk that's posed by all of these different aspects. And we'll go into later on in this course 
we'll go into how to conduct a risk assessment on all of these things and reduce that risk down to a level that's acceptable to the company and to its shareholders, stakeholders and anyone else that may be interested. Environmental impacts. What are they? Environmental impacts are any change to the environment, whether adverse or beneficial, wholly or partly resulting from an organisation's environmental aspects that we just went through. So we're looking at our resource impacts, um, depletion of resources of things that we're taking in and effects uh, of gaining and transporting those materials. Uh, atmospheric impacts, be it air pollution, consequential impacts such as acid rain, those sorts of things that may go on um, because of uh, what we're releasing due to our activities. Aquatic impacts, water pollution, um, and subsequent impacts which might result from, from that, such as eutrophication. Land impacts, contaminated land, erosion, those sorts of things that can occur, damage to human beings, wildlife, ecosystems. Community impacts, such as um, nuisance from noise, dust, visual impacts, loss of gain of amenity, all of those sorts of things. They're environmental impacts, and as stated before, they can be adverse or beneficial, and we need to manage those and make sure that uh, make sure we are maintaining the environment in in the way that uh, it exists now, as we find it, and or making it better. A policy, an environmental policy, introduces the reader to the company. Um, it provides a description about the company, tells us why that company exists, and that uh, that why is something that it will require a fair bit of thought and a fair bit of detail. Um, it talks about how the company goes about achieving um, why that company exists. It also talks about what that company actually does. But it, generally it provides the reader with an introduction to that company as if they've never heard of that company before. They now are going to know a little bit about it. Um, and as it establishes where it aims to sit in comparison with that market. And obviously, normally, most, co most companies are aiming to sit somewhere around that top. Uh, an environmental policy will, um, it, it must be really specific to that organization. It's got to really, it's, it's something that's got to be concise. Uh, it's got to commit to compliance with legislation and guidelines and standards. Also, um, uh, an environmental policy for an ISO 14001 uh, certification process uh, needs to be committing to continuous improvement, otherwise it's sort of it's going to be stagnant. Um, and um, also it needs to commit to establishing and regularly reviewing its environmental objectives and its environmental targets. An environmental policy must also be truthful. It can't be misleading. Uh, it's got to be backed by the EMS. It's got to talk about the EMS, the environmental management system that you've got, and how it's going to incorporate that into its daily operation. It's also this document, the policy, which is a one-page statement, uh, generally, is going to be written to the audience, to the customers, and to the stakeholders, the so people who are going to be reading this thing. And, and at the end, this document is going to be signed off. It's going to have a signature on the bottom by the highest level of management. Environmental objectives. Environmental objectives are goals that you will set that will help you to achieve what is written in the environmental policy. Environmental objectives must be consistent with the environmental policy they must be measurable. They need to be monitored. They need to be communicated throughout the organization and externally sometimes. They need to be updated regularly. And they need to be documented. And what I mean by documented, you need to be able to keep the evidence that shows that you have been achieving these objectives for future reference. That might be simply for an audit, it may be for regulators, it might be for stakeholders, the shareholders, but you need to keep that recorded information that shows you've been achieving those objectives.
environmental objectives need to be SMART. And when I say SMART, there's, that's an acronym. And this acronym stands for being specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Things to consider when you're putting together a set of environmental management objectives uh, are influencing factors upon that. Things such as legal requirements or your licensing conditions. You've got to look at those things and see how you will write your objectives to ensure you're going to maintain compliance. Environmental aspects, inputs and outputs that might be involved with your company and the, and the uh, different impacts and risks that the company presents, you need to consider those. Uh, views of interested parties, stakeholders, um, shareholders, customers. Uh, you need to look at, when writing objectives, how you're going to influence those views. Uh, operational and business requirements. What's the focus of the company? And what do they want to achieve? That These objectives need to clearly outline from an environmental perspective, what the company, what the company's goals are, you need to be looking at uh, the financial, financial goals, financial capability, uh, the financial, the, the risks that the company might be wanting and willing to take. The, then, last of all, you need to look at what technology, what sort of technology will be involved, what you'll have available, and what will be used to um, either to help you to. Uh, achieve those objectives, how you're going to monitor whether you are achieving those objectives or not. Um, all of these things need to take in, be taken into consideration uh, when, uh, when formulating your set of environmental objectives. Key performance indicators or KPIs. Think of KPIs as, uh, as like setting, a, setting an, an audible alarm in your car to indicate when you hit a certain speed limit. Uh, that, that's the sort of thing that a KPI is. It's, a, it's an indicator. It's a level that you set, a recognised level, that's going to tell you something that you want to know. Um, so, for example, some KPIs that you might set within an, an environmental uh, management system would be something like the, uh, the number of people that you want to train per month or number of people trained per month the number of uh, non-compliance non events, hopefully that's zero, but um, nevertheless, even zero, that'd be a KPI. That's, what you, that's your target. That's what you're aiming for each month, each year, that sort of thing. It could be the number of water samples or the, the certain parameters, the certain levels within those water samples that you might want to take. You might have a bandwidth um, that you want to keep within. Uh, those sort of things are KPIs. So when, when you're thinking about KPIs, these are the things to think about. They are key aspects that you need to monitor uh, that are going to help you to achieve your objectives. So they're developed from your objectives. Um, you need to be very cognizant of that process. When you're going through, those KPIs are going to relate directly back into those objectives. They are measurements. They will identify and show your performance of your system. How's your performance performing um, against those desired outcomes? So. Um, it's a it's like a like a, a speedo um, for your uh, for your for your management system and KPIs they enable your company to be able to make educated and smart decisions about the company's performance and where it's going and what it's doing. KPIs are absolutely critical in how you gauge your performance. Lead and lag indicators. Um, I'll start by saying it's important to have a mixture of both lead and lag indicators uh, within your key performance indicators. So they relate directly into, they're just two different types of indicators. And historically, most systems have relied upon lag indicators. Um, but I'll explain in, the, in a minute um, the difference between the two and why we need to have a mixture of both. So we'll start with lead indicators. Lead indicators, they indi they look at the process, they're like process indicators. Um, so they will show things that you are doing to prevent um, or to 
enable a certain outcome. Um, so for example, lead indicators would be things like number of people trained that you, you know, per month. There might be um, procedures that you've developed uh, over that period of time, or measures that have been implemented, things that have been put into place, uh, all of those sorts of things. That's lead indicators. They're, 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 think of them from a positive point of view. You're leading the way, um, uh, as opposed to lag indicators. Lag, in, uh, lag indicators are a results-based indicator, and people have used them historically. They're far easier to use, but um, often they are... Um, so the horse is already bolted. If you go down and take a sample of the water and it's over that required um, or that desired level, it's too late. You've already breached your condition or you've gone outside the various parameters. So um, <clears throat> they, they, they'll look at things like emissions released or waste volumes, etc. So lag indicators, while you can set certain indicators at levels that might think, okay, we're at we're at halfway, we're at three quarters, we're at 90%, oh, we've gone over. Um, yeah, lag indicators historically have been a limit and people monitor for that. Are we over our limit? Yes or no. Monitoring and auditing. Um, monitoring and auditing, they track the progress uh, towards an established set of objectives and enable smart decisions to be made along the way before they become critical. And think of this whole process of monitoring and auditing like um, you know, reading the dials in the cockpit of the plane. Um, you don't want to get in the plane without any dials um, and try and fly the plane. Um, you, you're probably not going to go all that well. Um, so likewise with your environmental management system, you want that thing to fly well. You don't want it to fail. So you need to monitor and audit though how it's performing, otherwise it will fail. Um, so let's look at monitoring um, and, and what it is. Um, it's, it's sort of defined as the assessment of performance through the gathering, the analysis and the interpretation of data. So we're going to pull that data in um, and we're going to see how it's performing, I suppose. Monitoring can be anything from walking around a site or in, inside your, your factory or, or wherever you might be, inside your facility. Um, and it's walking around, it's looking at how things are going. Are people putting things in place? Are they following the right procedures? Are they doing things the way that we're meant to be doing things? Are we getting the right levels? Are we testing the water? Are we under our certain thresholds? All of those sorts of things. Is our operation performing? So monitoring is like on a smaller scale, observing and, and ensuring that we're um, meeting the performance level that we want. Auditing, however, is a it's, a it's a larger process. It's a more systematic review of processes or procedures uh, or the results of the monitoring program that you've got to go to determine levels of conformance against a predetermined set of criteria. So audit and proper audit is a very formal process and there's a set of, series of steps that you've got to go through um, to conduct a proper audit. And there are two types of audits. You've got an internal audit that the company will go and conduct and you've got an external audit where you have a third party come in and they do a very strict, very rigid, non-biased assessment of your performance. Um, but it looks at the system and to see how is your system working? Is it meeting its intended outcome? It's not just looking at is their water level correct under the right level, etc. It's looking at are they, are they taking their water samples at the right time? Are they taking the right number that they're meant to be taking? Are they taking it in the right um, manner with the right techniques? Are they um, you know, following the guidelines that they're meant to be following? Queensland's got a set of guidelines for water sampling. Are they following those? It looks at other processes within the system to make sure the whole thing is working in accordance with the guidelines that have been established earlier on in our um, in our objectives, in our company policy, in our um, and and within other other areas of the organisation, within our license conditions, so auditing is a much larger process. 
How to design a monitoring system. It's a risk-based approach. So obviously we go back to our risk assessment that we've done. Um, risk match approach to ensure that the significant components and the potential impacts that can be managed um, in this process um, to deliver the desired outcomes. Those desired outcomes might, or oh, they'll be stated in our objectives, the company policy. And now this process, we want to be aiming well above regular, uh, regulatory compliance. It's, uh, it's one, thing for, um, one thing for us to say, yeah, we must comply, but compliance, compliance is sort of, it's the, the rock bottom, obviously. If you, if you don't comply, you go to jail or you pay the fine or you, um, you, you be, you're in a place that I, I don't want to be. Um, but so if you're not complying, you need to comply. Um, but you need to aim well above that. So from a company's point of view, you need to be aiming above regulatory compliance uh, as um, you, a, a company policy and, and outcomes uh, or, and objectives that we stated earlier, they sort of they should be more towards best practice. And the, the third part in there, we're looking at um, this, this monitoring system. It needs to present the identification of steps and trends in environmental performance. And what I mean by that, steps and trends. Trends is an easier concept because if we monitor yesterday and the day before and the day before, we can put that data up against each other and we, we can draw a, a line graph or something like that and we can see is are we going up or down, are we staying constant. Steps are a little bit, they're not so data orientated, they are more procedural based. Um, the legislation, um, in a roundabout way, says contaminants cannot be released into a waterway. Um, so, and let's say we've got an operation, we're doing a, a construction job that's down along beside a creek or a waterway, um, and we're monitoring that. So, um, if we solely look at that legislation and think contaminants cannot be released into the waterway, and we think, okay, we can establish a monitoring program or we go down and have a look in the in the creek and say okay nothing's in the waterway that's good and we go the next day oh something's in the waterway okay that's bad um that that sort of monitoring is only giving us a yes and no um and i'd strongly recommend that against that style of of monitoring we need to be looking at um a, a uh, what steps lead to that non-compliance and monitor those steps. So let's say, for example, you, you go down to the, uh, the waterway and we've got some oil drums that are sitting up in an unstable manner on the top of the creek. We've got some machines working around next to them and the lids aren't secured properly, etc., etc. You can look at it and think, okay, we should not have uh, oil drums sitting at this location, they need to be secured, they need to be bunded, they need to be etc etc. Um, so there's a whole heap of steps there that have been breached and um, and even just one of those steps, placing some drums at the top of the waterway, you, uh, you are moving that much closer to having that oil end up in the waterway. So um, they those steps and those processes need to be the things that you're monitoring against, and those things will be in your system. So you'll have a document in your system that talks about how to manage um, hazardous chemicals, let's say, and, and you'll have a set of procedures within there. Those are the things you're going to monitor against. And if you are hitting all your marks within that monitoring system um, over there, you can be very comfortable. You don't have to worry about contaminants ending up in your waterway because you know that you're not going to have that sort of result. Okay, looking at preparing a monitoring system. First of all, you're going to be looking at identifying your regulatory requirements. Uh, these set the minimum standard of performance. Um, you don't want to go below that. Um, then you're going to go about going, um, conducting a risk assessment. Uh, and that risk assessment you're going to go right through. Look at all of your processes, what's going on, what, um, what risks that uh, facility, project, whatever it might be, uh, presents and, and go about in through a lot of consultation, establishing a good series of mitigation measures, management measures to minimise, abate um, 
or get rid of some of those risks. Third, you're going to go about identifying some uh, steps and measures within your EMS. So in this case, let's assume we've got an EMS that has been written. And so with the procedures. So you're going to go through and identify steps and measures within that EMS to ensure that you've got all of those regulatory requirements, because they are the minimum, um, and your company objectives that are um, in line with our uh, company policy, they are going to be best practice to make sure all of those are going to be met. Okay, and so these are the things that we're going to monitor. Okay, then you're going to go about, um, in a lot of cases, it's going to provide a lot of value uh, if you can organise some baseline studies. Um, and so establish those, um, particularly in areas where you need to be able to um, show for evidence that you've got a sustainable operation. Uh, you, you might need it for something to fall back on and it forms a really good insurance down the track. I've had to use it many times where people will come along and say, oh, before this happened, it was all so wonderful and you can pull out that pre-baseline data that was back then and say, well, look, the noise or the water quality or the whatever was this originally um, and it's actually better. Um, so because uh, people's perception can, can vary a lot. A really important thing that can impact an environmental management system and the monitoring process, and that's something a lot, is the um, making sure that it's achievable. Does it fit within the budget that you've got um, or that, um, that is allowable? Um, and is it all that whole process, does it fit within a certain time frame that you can actually achieve it? Um, so in designing your monitoring program, you really want to be looking at trying to get some um, forming some data that has got trends. You want to do it regularly um, and record that data and get it up so that you can use it and look at those trends. Have we got levels increasing or decreasing or maintaining a certain level? These trends are what are going to show you whether um, your, how your performance is, whether you're going to be, uh, you know, they, they become a warning for you. Um, Having your monitoring so that it's transparent. Transparent, I suppose, both inwardly to the company and also outwardly. Um, so that transparent monitoring, it provides or enables you to establish a proactive and a positive corporate culture towards environmental management. If the guys who are involved in, let's say, that, uh, that bridge crossing of the creek, um, if they are aware of what levels they need to be they need to be maintaining uh, and you let them know every day or every how often you go to and, and take those samples if if they're aware of what those samples are they're going to be thinking about it on a regular basis from an outwards point of view if you're uh, if the stakeholders interested parties out in the community are aware of what's going on that can instill a lot of comfort and um, and keep people off your back ultimately um, and so the last point in there as well, and this I suppose is moving far, to, moving right towards best practice, uh, and that is trying to encourage research projects to use your data, um, and that's um, that I suppose is the ultimate amount of uh, transparent monitoring, um, but it moves towards that continual improvement and um, and best practice trends. Trends are really important to get into your monitoring program. Um, and you need to design your program so that you can use those trends and get them up in graphs and other uh, graphic displays so that you can use that data. The, the analysis of trends can show changes in performance at really early stages uh, and, and generally well before those changes are noticeable to an observer. And, and so the sort of things that trends can help you do in that, they'll show you when your system's performing well, they'll show it when it's not performing well, and, um, and they will also give that evidence to support uh, either decisions that need to be made or inform you on, um, on what decisions should be made. They're very important in that decision-making process. And an example uh, with trends and if you're monitoring and looking at those trends, think of 
um, some water temperature and using a monitor, uh, using a, th a thermometer in that process and you're marking it down, you'll be able to see that gradual increase in temperature over a period of time. If you are simply looking, feeling, observing, um, you're probably not going to uh, notice any change at all uh, for a long period of time until you start having some secondary effects occurring within that ecosystem. So, um, yeah, we can't stress enough how important it is to include trends within your monitoring system. Monitoring shortfalls. Let's look at what not to do when designing and putting together a monitoring program or when actually, con um, actually implementing a monitoring program. Um, so starting off with a, with a lack of clearly defined outcomes. So why are you monitoring? What do you want to measure? And are you wasting resources? Are you falling short of stakeholder expectations? You don't want to be out there wasting your time. You want to be out there actually achieving something and doing something that's going to be providing value. So think about these things and clearly define your outcomes um, and what you want to actually achieve. Um, going out, Collecting data but not using it. This is a terrible one and I've seen it a lot. Uh, failing to use that feedback for continual improvement. It's like a, a dis dysfunctional feedback loop. It's, um, I've seen many organisations collecting data and in some cases they've been well over um, their uh, permissible limits or their licence conditions and they've not analysed it, not realised it, just simply put it away in the files and um, they, no one found out until... The, um, until an audit went through um, and found that they were exceeding their levels. It's um, a massive shortfall, so don't do that. Uh, having a narrow or an exclusive set of performance measures, don't have a really sort of narrow area that you're monitoring in. Look at going broad, look around you and, and record what's going on. Um, failing to clearly articulate the purpose, the scope, the context, the findings. I suppose that's back similar to the first point. Lack of flexibility and a regular review with the, the intent of improvement. Okay, you want to have a, um, a continually improving, an, er an evolving, an ever-growing uh, monitoring system that uh, allows you to con have continual trends, but you want to be looking at the future as well. So having a lack of inadequate baseline data um, being established at the onset. So it's really important to get out and get a good baseline set of data. Go and do the initial establish, um, or initial investigation to establish what is there to start with. Um, another bad thing to do, not recording local observations and changes in the environment of the operation, uh, which may explain variances in the data sets or the trends okay if um, if you're doing some work on a creek here and just upstream someone's just driven a tractor through and you've got plumes of sediment coming down and you've sort of oh, massive spike in turbidity in our creek system um, you need to make a note to say that ah that's actually due to something else going on or it might be something within your operation but Making a record of that allows you to explain those results and not just um, have unexplained spikes or troughs or that sort of thing occurring in your data. Lack of data quality control. Uh, you need to have set procedures um, and follow those set procedures every time. Make sure you're recording your data uh, and so that it's repeatable. Unrecorded changes in the monitoring process, equipment or circumstances, Okay, yep, so those monitoring processes, you need to be making sure that all of those things are recorded. If things change, you must record them in against that data. Um, they're not only monitoring in accordance with regulatory requirements. Okay, think broader than just regulatory requirements. Think about what is going to be most beneficial, what is providing greatest benefit, what's going to enable people to make the best decisions what is going to um, give a, a good reputation for the company. Uh, so think about um, that early identification, uh, identification of change um, and, and also look at that 
um, specific cause, what is going to cause those changes. Um, and last point there, failing to incorporate accurate findings um, from lessons learned and past processes and, and, and jobs that have occurred. See it time and time again. People make the same mistakes on new projects. You've got to have a lessons learned. You've got to think at the start of the project, pull in information and um, um, experience and, and set up a system that draws upon the experience of your team so that you don't make the same, decision, uh, same mistakes that have been made in the past. Looking at auditing. Auditing is used to monitor compliance against external and internal regulation, guidelines, policies, standards, procedures. It looks at your system. It's a tool that's used to, to assess performance of the company's environmental and social programs against an agreed set of audit criteria. So something that's been established prior to, as I've mentioned before, audits are very have a very set process that they need to follow. And so at the onset, there'll be a very, uh, there'll be an audit, a set of audit criteria that'll be established. And it looks at other systems being applied properly. Are they in accordance with that criteria? Can the whole process be done better? And in that auditing process, you'll have recommendations for improvement. There may be non-conformances um, uh, and, and other categories of things in there, but it's gonna provide you with uh, recommendations out of that process um, to try and get your system better. Um, auditing is a, is a critical it's a critical tool in that continuous improvement process. Something that really needs to be done and normally you'd go through, you'd do an internal audit prior to having an external audit because obviously you want to make it look, make your system as good as you can get it before someone else comes in and has a look. So you'll do your internal audit iron out as much as you can and then get someone who's totally fresh come and have a look at the system and tell you how you were going and um, the audits they encourage benchmarking benchmarking is sort of assessing your performance against other um, other companies within the industry or, or that, that sort of thing so to look at industries uh, how are you performing you know, with respect to them. Uh, there might be a gaps analysis in there to tell you, okay, you're missing or you need to improve in those areas or yeah, missing these, these aspects within your system. Um, it provides that continuous improvement uh, aspect so that you can go, okay, we're not performing here, we need to perform better. Uh, and, um, and so it's not just focusing on compliance. 